Thank you very much and good hey to everybody. Thanks for joining me on these very special times. Thanks to the organizers, to the people who have worked on making this meeting, very special meeting possible. Um, it's definitely an honor for me to talk to you. And I'm reporting on work jointly with colleagues, Tobias Brighton, who just started at the Technical University of Berlin today, Dante Kalise, who I guess is in home office near the University of Nottingham, but he's also in the room with us tonight, Laurent Pfeiffer, who has recently moved to Polytechnic, and Daniel Walter, who is working with me at the Academy of Sciences in, at the Rannon Institute in Linz, which is in Austria. Um, to, set, to set the stage, I'm considering a controlled dynamical system, system Y dot equal Fy plus Pu. F at zero is zero. So that zero is a steady state of this equation. And the focus will be the stabilization of this steady state by means of optimal control. So by means of this formulation, which we have seen in several of the previous talks, of course. L at zero is zero, and we might as well think of this as y square in many occasions. I write it here more or less in the notation of ordinary differential equations, but it, I'm definitely also very interested in the situation where this is a PDE or a discretized PDE. We know that the value function, which assigns the minimum to j as a function of the initial condition, we very well know that this value find satisfies the hamilton jacobi bellman equation. Since it's infinitesimal problem, it's a stationary nonlinear PD with the boundary condition B at zero is zero. I'm considering the very special case that you had, where there are no constraints, you is a linear space. So we can solve by hand this minimization. The optimizer is given, involves the gradient of V. We can stick in U into the HDB equation, and we arrive at this form, which will be the focus today. And implicitly, I assume, in fact, that the value function is C1, which can be proved in certain quite a few situations, at least locally. Uh, and but also not only in the case without constraints, but also in the case with control constraints. State constraints is a totally different story as we have heard yesterday. Once we have the U, we <clears throat> as a function of gradient V, we can close the loop. Now I close the loop. All right. <laughs> with this red term here. So if we would just be able, if we are just able to solve for V, everything would be neat, right? But the trouble is the dimension of this PD is the dimension of the state space. And if in fact it's a PD, then it's an operator theoretic HGP equation. So it's um, not only challenging, it's impossible. So uh, the question is, of course, why are we so interested in that? We, we know that we could linearize everything inside. We made a quadratic approximation, and we could use Riccati, as has been done for decades, and locally it stabilizes. So Riccati is quite useful. We shouldn't forget about it. In fact, this is, we, I think the engineers will keep using it, and we have to make it sort of a step for the nonlinear world that it is really giving it, there's a difference. So is it worthwhile all the effort we are investing? And if it's worthwhile, how do we get solution? And we have several lists of things to do and possibilities. So let me also 
give my version of it. Of course, we can solve directly with grid-based methods. We have heard it in the previous talk today. Or we can improve somewhat by tensor train techniques. Or we can train neural networks. We can use Taylor expansion, as in, explained by the talk by Art Kraina on Monday. We can interpolate from open loop data, as we have also heard in the talk by Gong and collaborators. We can use hop formulas, we can use max plus and other techniques. And of course, there are contributors for all these items in the audience, and I really appreciate learning from them. So today, I want to make contributions towards these three items. I'll talk about tensor train calculus. I'll also train a neural network, but differently from the previous uh, aspects which have been discussed. And time permitting, I'll talk about Taylor expansion. First things first, chapter zero. Is it worthwhile in the first place? OK, let's look at the PDE at the controlled neural Whitehead equation, y prime, Laplace and y times y times y minus y squared, one minus y square, plus a control, which is acting on a subset of the spatial domain minus one, one. And the control action is really the amplitude of this controller with Neumann boundary conditions and initial condition. This PD has three steady states, the origin, which is unstable, and plus minus one is stable equilibrium. And it may look simple, but still it has already some um, application. It describes excitable systems like neurons or axons. It relates to the Flurry model in theoretical chemistry. It describes very banal convection and so on. So let's look at this and compare a Riccati-based optimal control after linearization at the origin and HGP controls. On the left, the, the gray bar shows you the state, the uncontrolled state. It goes to one of the, it doesn't go to zero as we wish, it rather goes to one, which is state. So it, of course, uncontrolled. Then we look at the brown bar or curve. It's the linear quadratic state. It's the state corresponding to the linear quadratic regulator control. It goes towards zero, but it is awfully slow. And then we take a HDB based controller where the dimension of the discretized state space is 14. And we see, oh, that one goes really quite rapidly already. And dimension 40 does better in the transient zone, but far out, it's about the same. And the controllers look really very, very different. So yes, there's a difference between HGB and recapture. And it can be much worse than that, or much more in favor of HGB, because sometimes uh, Riccati just doesn't do the, the job, as we'll see later. Chapter one, towards, towards neural network-based optimal control. By the way, this work is inspired by HTB, but we are not using the network to approximate the HTB, but rather the feedback function. In detail. So I'm looking again at y dot equal fy plus bu, and the cost is now really quadratic in the state and the control. And I will use the space of trajectories, L2 functions, as well as their derivatives are also in L2. Functions which live in this space have the property that asymptotically they go to zero. So our interest is optimal feedback stabilization. Our interest is to find <clears throat> an expression for the optimal control as a function of the state. And we know that 
up to uniqueness and technical issues, it's given like that. Once we know the value function. I'm interested to do that for the initial conditions lying in a compact subset by zero of the state space containing the origin. And I'll make a stabilizability assumption. The soup of the optimal states over the possible initial conditions by zero and kept by zero should be bounded by a constant M0. So this constant is going to come up several times as I go along. All right. And now <clears throat> I am formulating a learning program. I want to learn the feedback jump function calligraphic F. That's unknown. Learn it over a certain space <clears throat> by minimizing this over a certain space of functions. The space of functions are the Nemitsky operators of, of Lipschitz continuous functions on this ball which I'm working on. No, it's twice the radius of the ball that I'm working on. And of course, f at zero should be zero, so it's clear. So rather than solving HGB, I I'm training a function calligraphic f. And you could one could say, yes, maybe this is reasonable, but maybe not. Anyway, um, I'm looking for a function over a state space, and I only have information along the I can train only along the trajectory y of t. And maybe I have only one initial condition. So this is not enough information. Even if the space trajectory, well, maybe it's curve, uh, it's space filling curve, but if it's not, then it's not enough. So I'll take more initial conditions and I average this. So I'm doing this. But more generally, why not go and say, my uh, in the, the, the space of possible initial condition is a complete probability space, and I minimize the ensemble of solutions as a function of the initial conditions into the state space. Okay, this is the learning problem. Uh, after this, under what reasonable assumption, it admits a solution, and we have equivalence between the new almost everywhere solutions of the original problem that I formulated and this um, probabilistic problem. All right. Now, next step is to solve. Well, if it, it's, even if the dynamical system is finite dimensional, the F here is infinite dimensional. It's a function space. So I need to approximate it. And here is where the neural network Set in. We are going to you to, to, to approximate the learning problem within the learning. We are going to approximate the feedback function by a neural network. Everybody knows neural networks. Nonetheless, one slide on recap of neural networks. Let's start down here. Each layer is represented by a function little f. The network is represented by the superposition of these functions. Each one of these functions, fi, except the uppermost one, <coughs> consists of an affine part, an activation function acting on it, and only the upper one, uppermost one, the highest layer, is aff just affine. Theta are the parameters of the network, the matrices and the coefficients B. Um, there's the parameter space R consisting of these Euclidean spaces. What's really important and which characterizes all of that space anyway is are the dimensions of these matrices. We call it the architecture. All right. And if, when I'm quickly try to learn whatever I needed about neural networks, very quickly one learns that one should use all the information of the underlying problem at hand. And one of pieces of information is that our feedback function at the origin should be zero. So I take this network function 
and subtract its value at the origin. So the network functions F theta have also the property that F at zero is zero. Sure. Now I go back to my learning problem. No, no. I wish, I wish I could go back to my learning problem, but we don't want to use this only for what only for numerics. We only also want to justify the approach by um, approximation result. So I looked up what <coughs> I, I thought, what I looked what we needed, and I looked what we can find. And what we needed is an approximation result um, in the space of C1 functions. And uh, is allowing as many constraints on the parameters, on the network parameters as possible. Because anyway, we want to formulate an optimization problem and we want to prove existence for it. So we looked for such type of an approximation result. We couldn't find it. And so therefore, we sharpened our pencil and proved. That for any eta one and eta two, which are bounds on the uppermost <coughs> W matrix and on the affine parts, and, <coughs> and that assuming that the activation function sigma is not a polynomial, then for every epsilon, which is the parameter which gives you <coughs> the approximation rate, there exists a, num a number L epsilon of layers, and there exists an architecture as well as a neural network, theta epsilon, such that we have a C1 approximation of this optimal value function. All right. This type of theta epsilon parameters will appear in the following slides. Okay. So I need to now prove existence for my then for my approximated neural networks. The original I take in these neural network functions, and we prove that under approximate under appropriate stabilizability conditions on the linearized control system, there exists an epsilon one, a threshold, such that for all epsilon which are smaller than this epsilon one, this <coughs> approximated control systems um, have a solution and they approximate the original up to or by order epsilon. So quite, quite well. Moreover, they can also be uniformly bound. All right. Now I take this in piece of information and go back to the optimal neural network feedback law, which arises from considering the learning problem this is the learning problem as on the previous slide, but now with a neural network feedback function. This is the dynamical system with a neural network feedback function. And since we eventually want to prove and also justify the approach, we need to get some, we need to guarantee the, the radial unboundedness. Radial unboundedness comes from two features. One of them, wherever we could have in our universal approximation theorem, bounds on the parameters, on the uppermost matrix, on the uh, affine coefficients bi, we take those. There, where we could not keep the bounds in the universal approximation theorem, we must use a penalty term. So we put the penalty term there. Then, under, for this formulation, we have global minimizers for the neural network learning problems for all sufficiently small epsilon. Good, but we still need to show, verify that as epsilon goes, zero, goes to zero, this goes towards our original learning problem and therefore also towards the, the solutions, go to the HTP solutions. So if this parameter alpha, which appears as the penalty parameter in the penalty functional, is sufficiently small, then we have this estimate, which involves the optimal value function, j, and the value function evaluated along the neural network feedback functions. 
Anyway, this is larger because it's not optimal. So this left inequality is obvious. The right one need, we need to work, okay? That can be obtained. In particular, we have convergence of the cost functionals. Convergence of the cost function is always relatively easy. Then one needs additional work to guarantee also convergence of the associated states and controls. And we have each weak accumulation point, y hat, u hat, of this neural network solutions in this natural spaces. <clears throat> this is the Bochner space uh, over the initial conditions with trajectories in W infinity. And this is the L2 space of the controls. Fulfills the a priori bound, and each accumulation point is in the set where we have our good conditions. It, it, we can go to the limit in the equation and in the controls. The arc mean, these weak accumulation points are solutions of the original problem. And if the um, weight is put in the cost functional, which weights the states, is positive definite, we even have strong convergence. So this is a neural network approach where we show conversions. And the next step for sure is to look how it behaves under, for a numerical realization. Well, in our numerical realization, we had two phases. We had to train the feedback function and we have to validate the feedback function. Okay. Well, one thing is we are not so in the training phase, we are not solving infinite horizon problems, but we solve uh, um, finite horizon problems with T sufficiently large. We throughout we take eight layers, each layer is <clears throat> is n two by two. Sigma is a ReLU function, which is a little bit regularized. We in practice we add residual connectors. Okay, we, we use skip connections as they were um, already mentioned by uh, Professor E on, on Monday. And we assume that the constraints and the weight for the penalty are not really needed, which we used for the theory, but we did not implement. Or we implemented, but we didn't take overly serious. All right. First step is, of course, does this approach in the linear quadratic case, give us the same solutions as we get with Ricard. This is just a phase if, where we make sure that we have the basic feasibility of the approach. So we look at the LC circuit, electrical circuit, with two conductors, one capacitor, one source, a control voltage is the controller U is the source here. So the state consists of two magnetic fluxes and the charge. We want to minimize the combined magnetic electric energy. And the next one we hope is one of um, these slides or figures, which is uh, more or less only of interest to the creator, because in practice, they, they are not looking very exciting, right? Uh, you see on top of each other the linear quadratic and the neural network optimal state. And they do the same thing. The, <clears throat> and the same is true for the controllers. Okay, so this is logarithmic. So that they go to zero, both of them, as they should be. Next thing is, let's go to the Van der Poel equation and let's control the Van der Poel. All right, <clears throat> we are training with only five training initial conditions, one, two, three, four, five training initial conditions. And then we are using different initial conditions to see whether the feedback junction that we train also stabilizes those on the following slide. Okay, on the left here, you see the Y1, Y2 space, of the Van der Poel equation. The origin is where my hand is. You see blue and red dots for initial conditions. The blue ones, which co correspond to the training set, 
and the red one for, red ones for the validation set. And the curves are the orbits. Now, maybe we don't remember precisely what the uncontrolled vulnerable does. This here is the, uh, are the solutions of the under, uncontrolled vulnerable. The origin of the vulnerable is unstable. So that the solutions are um, painting away, but they don't go to infinity, but they are captured by <clears throat> uh, within a, a, a curve around the, an orbit uh, around the um, origin, which is actually attracting from the inside and repellent from the outside. So all these initial conditions are on the outside. So if we do nothing, they are tending to infinity. Fine. Then let's look first at the, what the neural network control trajectories do. That we are training with blue, and all the blue ones go to the, to go to the origin. OK. Now we look use the same feedback function on the validation that set, and they also converge there. Now we Let's look for the linear quadratic regulator. And lo and behold, some go to the origin, but if the initial condition is too far away from the origin, they diverge. So it's AQI is local, as we know anyway, but here, uh, the, really, the issue was the point our neural network approach. And um, as I said, I'm also interested in applying our concepts to PDEs. So we are looking at the viscous burgers equation. Uh, that's for the non-experts, that's like a look at like a one-dimensional Navier Stokes equation. I don't write it here, uh, but we anyway we discretize this by Chebyshev polynomials, 14 Chebyshev polynomials. And here we see results which can correspond to different initial conditions which correspond to the situation where there is uncontrolled linear quadratic regulator and some type of approximation to the nonlinear quadratic regulator, BSE regulator, and then the neural networks. And to make this story short, let's look at uh, the result from the, for the initial condition on the top right. And we see that neural network always converges. And we see the values of the state cost, the control cost, the total cost. And the other ones, either they diverge for infinity or they converge to some constant, which is not the origin. And that's because we use, this is not contradicting anything. We use neural, uh, we use Neumann boundary conditions. So the viscous burger equation, the origin is zero, but not asymptotically stable. So if you are get if your <coughs> state gets caught by a constant, it's going to stick near the constant for all times. Okay, so that's the end of chapter one, which was on training um, the feedback functions by neural networks. Another approach that we followed uh, with Dante Calvisia, who is in the audience, is some structure exploiting policy iteration. I start for convenience by recalling the equation we are interested in. Now we have stationary HTB. If we have a solution, we have the optimal control. And policy iteration for me is really more or less like basically Newton's method on this nonlinearity. By the way, especially in the context of discrete time systems, policy iteration is also called Howard algorithm. Or in the world of Riccati, it's somehow like Newton Kleinman iteration. Okay. So let's write down the policy iteration algorithm. We need to initialize with a stabilizing control. That's 
a condition, sometimes a drawback. And then we iteratively solve. As soon as we know already un, we solve the linearized equation for vn plus one. It's still a high order hyperbolic equation, but linear. We update the control when we iterate. I already said the initial condition must be asymptotically stabilizing. And what we do, either we will have one at hand, or if we don't, then we typically just introduce a discount factor and work with the discount factor to get into a neighborhood and then um, initialize the quote original problem by the discounted control. That's quite effective in practice. But it's still uh, driven by the, this as it stands, it's still driven by the curse of dimensionality. Of course, uh, in our situation, especially in the context of PDEs, we have two types of infinities. The dynamical system is infinite dimensional. So number one, to handle that, we really use a mesh free discretization of the dynamical system. Pseudospectral collocation based on Chebyshev polynomials is one possibility. And the other infinite dimensionality is, of course, the one related to the HTB equation. Look, two, let me say that the PD, let me assume that the PD is already discretized, so we have a finite dimensional state, D dimensional state. We make an assumption on the free dynamics F, a structural assumption. Namely, that they are separable in each of their each of their coordinates. So F i is a finite sum of of a product of functions in each coordinate. So instead of having one function here of several co coordinates. We're having a product of functions of one coordinate each. That's the structural assumption. By the way, if one discretizes PDEs, uh, that's not a very, that's an assumption, but it, it still, there are many PDEs which fall in this class where eventually one has a separable structure. All right. So we take that as a first step. And now uh, let me go back to this solving this linear. Generalized, as people call it, the, the, uh, it, one has to get used to this terminology. This linear equation, which arises as the linearization of the nonlinear one, is called generalized HUB equation. We have to solve. I made already a structural assumption that this is separable. Now I, I use a complete set of uh, um, basis for the d dimensional polynomial. Of, of, of set of d-dimensional polynomial basis function by which we approximate the real function. So at this moment, these basis functions are still functions of, they're not assumed to be separate yet. But I, anyway, I stopped my expansion at dimension n, n number of basis functions in the d-dimensional space. And then we, we express the derivative of the value function in this form, we have the control, we stick this into the general linear generalized HTB equation, we have a dense system of tremendous dimension. Still. So what I did, what did I do so far in this context? A mesh-free discretization of the PD, separability of the nonlinearity, Galerkin type approximation of the generalized HB equation using typically globally supported polynomial, polynomials, like monomials, Legendre polynomials. Now we have high dimensional integrals to evaluate, which is of course a, a tremendous job. We are going to use the, exploit the separable structure more and more over next, all the basis functions, uh, assumed to be a product type. 
So the system, if we count the number of variables, still has a curse of dimensionality. It's a linear system of the order n, which is the number of basic functions to the power d, which is the um, dimension of the state space. And the next step is we set up the linear systems and do a tensor train decomposition. N and D are as before, and R in this expression is a tensor rank. I'm not going to go into tensor ranks, but typically one needs to do whether N, D, R square. So the question arises, um, how should we choose the tensor rank? I think it's very complicated to give a straightforward answer, a very convincing answer. Uh, but um, in for the linear quadratic case, for the Riccati situation, if you wish a conversion <laughs> approximation property of order epsilon, then the tensor rank should be logarithm of one over epsilon to the power seven over two. So in the linear quadratic case, we have a we have a theorem which guarantees that. Then there's a comment on how to solve the linear systems which arise. We are doing it by um, the LS scheme because it preserves the tensor train structure. Now, how about results? Well, the result which I showed in chapter zero was precisely done with this approach. Okay. It was the neural whitehead equation in dimension 40. And uh, it was giving results very, very different from Riccati. This is work, joint work with Sergei Dolgov, who is really the expert on the train set train computation and the article. Uh, the underlying PDE is still of dimension one. We did dimension two uh, with uh, um, uh, conversions on the order of 121. Uh, ODE systems. And this could still give quite reasonable results, but I don't want to go too much further in this direction. But um, yeah, some comments on the performance. Uh, this is done uh, by using Lachand de polynomials for each individual di di uh, direction of degree four. And for this is for the neural Vitetic system. And here you see the, on the abscissa uh, the dimension, so between 10 and 40. What is the increase in the TT rank? Not maybe it's lower than even linear. And the number of iterations of the policy iteration of a Newton scheme. On the one hand. On the other hand, I mean. Um, how much, what is the time, the computational time, which was needed um, as a function of the accuracy? Okay, and as a function of the dimension. And the dimension you see, uh, well, the CPU time, of course, increased, all right? The accuracy goes nicely down, the time increases, and everything in some sense as we is expected. So we are least, and that's certainly using the tensor TT schemes is certainly one option among many others how to make progress, I think. I go to my chapter three, I have 10 minutes left, and somehow link this up to the talk of Art Krainer um, on Monday. I want to start with an application. And controlling the Fokker Planck equation. Okay, there's a the Fokker Planck equation is somehow used, you think, a lot of a swarm of particles driven by a stochastic ODE, and you want to describe them under the, the influence of a confining, confining potential W. W is here, you see, it has three things. And the particles want to go into these things. 
But if say lots of particles are here and you want to move them to the, to the other thing, you have to cross this energy barrier. In spite of the fact that the modeling for this is the focal plant, which has the origin as a stable origin, this can be awfully slow. All right. So by the way, for this potential, there's the stationary distribution of the particles. You see where there are the things, you have the maxima of the particles. All right. And the, the model for that involves the probability distribution function of all of the location of the particles in this interval x to x plus delta x. It's a parabolic type equation in the variable O. We had the W on the previous uh, slide. There is a variation of boundary condition, initial condition. All right. And yeah, of, of course, since it's a probabilistic object, uh, the integral of uh, O0 should be one. Should. Now controlling those. Um, Oh, it's just a couple of statements still about the control. The control will be of the form W, the old uh, confining potential, and alpha plus U. So I have a certain shape of my controller, maybe by the Houtus criterion, but my <clears throat> the amplitude is the control. It convert the and control system and converges to a a stationary solution, but extremely slowly because of these energy barriers, which are the differences of the max and the mean in these confining potentials. There are lots of nice questions about this type of control problems. Uh, but let me say, after a shift towards the stationary solution, the origin is a st zero steady state. It explains that we now have a bilinear control. Anyway, it was already bilinear here. So we have a control in the bilinear term and in the affine term. All right. So I'm interested in such type of bilinear problems. But first, let me show you a numerical simulation. All right. That is how the control. I put all my particles here and I want to go towards the steady state. So I, I turn on time, and this is the layman's movie. But I'm sure this way it won't, uh, it will work. The black one is the steady state. The, blue, the red one is the uncontrolled solution. But we want to speed it up by control. That's the blue one. All right, then we go and go. And the blue one has almost made it. The red one, you wait for. It. All right, so that's the issue. And for this problem, we want to consider bilinear control problems, the minimal value function as before. Of course, I assume that this is stabilizable. A, B is stabilizable. And the name of the game, yeah, and now I write the Hamiltonian. I had a, a is the linear part. This is the bilinear part, the control part, the cost. Um, again, I can minimize by hand I have this HDB and the optimal feedback flow. Perfect. I could use one of the my first two techniques that we have talked about, but now I want to use the one of the very very classical techniques, namely Taylor expansion. The basic idea was explained on Monday. Assume that we can expand, and in fact we proved. The previous problem um, for the Fokker plan that the value function is infinitely differentiable. That is a little bit of extra work. But then we can have a feedback law of this type. If we stop with k, at k equal 2, then it's just Riccati, by the way. And the names associated with Albrecht, Lux, and Mr. Trainer. And in infinite dimensions, this wasn't carried out so much. Um, um, by Devenet, Bouchot, Raymond, Mr. Brighton has some results, infinite dimension, uh, Mr. Trainer now, uh, some work on that, on, as presented on Monday. OK, now we start to write the Taylor expansion. 
And oh, hey, Carl. Sorry, just a uh, five minute mark. I, thank you very much. I, <laughs> I, I'm trying to do my own job, but please tell me. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, please keep telling me. I am speeding up. Okay, one differentiation we can do. We can all do one, we don't learn anything. We can do two, and we are a little bit unhappy because of all the terms. But now we know that the value function at the origin, we evaluate this at the origin. So the value function at the origin is zero. So we use this and we find recovery. And we go to higher and higher order terms. I, don't, I spare you that. And eventually we get a close, but I almost closed loop formula, which involves the case order derivatives, which are multilinear forms. They are vectors, and they are tensors. On the right hand side, you also see derivatives, but they are all of lower order. So, um, what I want to say is we have a general structure theorem for this Albrecht's method, which in the, on the first level gives the Cati, and on the higher order levels, it is basically all these equations, once you start pondering over them, are generalized Lyapunov equations. Okay, once we have it, we can do quite a bit with it. We get a feedback formula, we can close the loop, and we want to prove theorems also. We have locally the true value, the infinite dimensional exact analytic value function minus the one based on the Telia's function does the job we expect it to do. It's of the order two to the P. That's good. And so are the states and the controls. All right. And we do also work out the linear system for that. They have a curse of dimensionality, granted. But we use balanced truncation to break the curse of dimensionality. And we use all the nice work by Grasetik, Hackbusch, and Stenger to approximate these inverses, which are anyway written as exponentials, by suitably weighted integration. And in this way, and that's my last slide, next to last slide, we could utilize for the uh, Fokker plan this approach. And you see here in black the optimal open loop solution, the optimal solution. How did we get it by open loop code? And then the Riccati in blue, third order Taylor, seventh order Taylor expansion. In place of a table of content, which I may, might have, should have given, maybe, I do a summary. I talked about HTB and the curse of dimensionality. I had some comments or contributions to training neural networks to approximate the feedback function, to policy iteration, exploiting the several structure, and finally, very briefly, Taylor expansion by utilizing a model reduction, and again, Taylor calculus. With that, I came to an end, and thank you for attending and listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl Kunish, for the talk, and uh, I guess we'll, I'll, we'll take questions now. Okay, uh, Levon, I'll go ahead and, uh, and unmute you, please. Hi, Carl. Thanks for the talk. So uh, for the uh, neural network part, basically, uh, this, you're choosing some initial data mu, right? Uh, so, so, so you're solving the problem for some initial position, and then you're applying it to some new points, right? Yeah, I'm training the network by an ensemble of initial conditions, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So how do you choose this ensemble? Because if uh, it, it also has to do with the generalization, right? So if it's 
with this ensemble is concentrated too much in one part of the space, the initial data, then it may not generalize well to the other, let's say, a new point which is far from this ensemble. So how do you yeah, sure. make sure I, that the high I dimension... I completely agree. <laughs> sure. I completely agree. And we had endless discussions, but we, uh, quite frankly, we just do it heuristically at this moment, right? Sure. Uh, but, 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 I mean, uh, look here. I mean, look at the blue and the red points. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we are not we are not cheating, right? You see some validation points which are far from the training points, right? Sure, sure. So, so that, but I, yes, I mean, we could, oh, sure, we, we also played with, with choosing them stochastic by random number generator. We, we played with all kinds of things, but I have no theorem to offer. Yeah, because if it's very high dimensions, maybe it's it's not like grid, but uh, kind of like uh, you need kind of uniform, more or less uniform sampling, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the Burgers was 14 dimensions, so it was already reasonable dimension. Right, right. Uh, okay, thanks, uh, Levon. And uh, next speaker uh, will be Wayne on, or next question. Um, Please wait on. Uh, I thought it was very nice to, that you can prove convergence of the states and control for the neural network models. Um, on the other hand, regarding uh, the convergence rates, so people often invoke universal approximation theorem just to, to talk about the, you know, the validity of neural networks. I think that was also done. I, I mentioned that point, at, at one point at um, Jerome's talk. Um, that that that's sort of missing uh, something because the universal approximation theorem is also true for polynomials. That's the classical vice price theorem. But we know polynomials, piecewise polynomials, they don't work in high dimensions. So I think there is something more that's needed in order to really elucidate the advantage of neural network models. That's just a comment. My question is that can you comment on the choice of the probability to measure mu? <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. Number one, I'm completely aware of it, okay? <laughs> we are just not there yet. The, the, your comment, okay. the universal approximation okay. theorem is just a, 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 it's maybe I'm completely aware that we need to do convergence rates and um, also, I mean, we need to, we need to do something about the, the number. We need to do the rates plus the complexity. That's what I wanted to say, yeah, which is not done yet. Mm. We, we, it's on our list, but we don't know. Uh, the, the, uh, the measure, uh, we, are <laughs> we are very pragmatic. I cannot say anything sophisticated. We want to just, at the same time, have um, the discrete case and the continuous case in one formulation. So I have no sophisticated answer. Nice. Let's say we have a, a biased, uh, you know, nice. non-Gaussian measures or whatever. I, uh, that's probably very interesting. Could be interesting, but uh, nice. we have not closed the loop there. But that's, I mean, the work is very, very recent. <laughs> But it could be interesting, yeah. Okay. I mean, if you, I am more than willing to learn from you on that. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Thanks, uh, Wayne. And um, I'll go ahead and uh, call on Krenner. Uh, okay, I unmuted you, Krenner. Or yeah, please, Krenner. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Good. Very nice talk, Carl. I'm very impressed with your convergence results. I want to see that in more detail. Um, okay. The one thing I was stressing on Monday was that once you get the uh, left eigenvectors of the closed loop linear dynamics, the calculations of the higher polynomial terms are essentially diagonal. They're trivial, absolutely trivial. And I was wondering if you saw anything like that in your tensor analysis. 
I noticed your comment on Monday, uh, and I have not linked it yet. Okay, I don't know because we are. I, I think it get, it might get lost in the in the in the in the way uh, do we are using the linear algebra. How push is linear algebra? Uh, but maybe there's a way to combine it. I don't know. So I didn't know so quickly. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you, uh, Kreiner, for the question. And um, does anyone else have any more questions? We have until we have five minutes left for more questions. Um, okay. I guess. Uh, is a question for Maurizio in the chat. Oh, 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 sorry. Okay, yeah. Oh, uh, I'll unmute you, Maurizio. Um, hold on. Let me just find you. Okay. So, I all right. No, please go ahead. For the, for the talk, and uh, so I have a, uh, I have a curiosity regarding the training in order to get the feedback law without passing through the value function. So you are looking for a feedback law. <clears throat> and you are training the network on several initial starting conditions uh, uh, where you apply an open loop control. So what guarantees that at the very end this will, uh, will be uh, accurate enough uh, to, to get a feedback control? There is something that I, I didn't get. Because you are training the network, but everything you are giving to the network is open loop. You are just taking a lot of initial positions, uh, and the question where, where, and how you choose the the initial conditions is, of course, a, a rather interesting point. But even if you have equally distributed initial positions, if you have agreed and you have a lot of information, so interpolating control is a risky issue. So can well, you we're not only interpolating the control, Maurizio. We are interpreting also the derivative of the value function. Okay. Okay. We are interpreting, we are approximating. You can approximate a function and its derivatives. So, I mean, that is why I so much in this. And you can approximate the feedback. So, so the, 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 the fact that you are getting an information on feedbacks is hidden in the fact that you are approximating the grid. Yeah. Is that no, it's hidden? <laughs> I didn't hide it. Uh, yeah, it's maybe hidden. Yeah, okay. It's hidden. Yes, it's hidden. No, no, no. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't completely get this from the, from the very first moment. So the, the, the fact that you are approximating the gradient gives you a, a rather reasonable approximation of the feedbacks. Yes. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe if this satisfies you, I'm happy. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, looks like no one has a question. Okay, so I guess uh, we'll take a break. Uh